Okay, so now the moment we've all been waiting for, I'd like to introduce our two guests. First, we have Marnie Davis. Marnie Davis is a historian of ethnicity and immigration in the United States. She's the author of Jews and Booze, Becoming American in the Age of Prohibition, which was a finalist for the Sammy Rohr Prize in Jewish Literature. She is currently researching and writing about Jewish and African-American neighborhoods in 20th century Atlanta and the relative impact of redlining, urban renewal, and suburbanization upon these communities. We also have Harlan Green. Harlan Green is a co-author of Mapping Jewish Charleston along with Dale Rosengarten and Alyssa Neely, both of whom are in attendance tonight. Harlan Green is an archivist and a historian. He has published both fiction and nonfiction works. And in 1991, he won the Lambda Literary Award for Gay Fiction for his novel, What the Dead Remember. He was nominated for the same award in 2005 for his novel, The German Officer's Boy, based on the events of Kristallnacht. In addition to his writing, Green is a scholar in residence at um, and former head of special collections here at the College of Charleston, where he collected materials relating to Jewish history in the Charleston area. Green is a Charleston native and a 1974 graduate of C of C. So welcome. I'm very excited to be here with you tonight. I think the beginning is probably the best place for us to start. And I think we would all like to hear a bit about your projects. Uh, for instance, we would all like to know uh, how they came about, what inspired you to undertake this research, and perhaps you could share some highlights with each of us. Uh, Marnie, should we begin with you? Unmute, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so um, why don't you, uh, Kim, are you gonna share the screen and we can uh, bring up the website. Okay, yes. So this is a, a website, it's called Streetscape Palimpsest. And if that word is uh, unfamiliar to you, a palimpsest is a, um, I get, you could say it's a written document that uh, has several different historical layers of writing on them. For instance, if someone's doing research on the medieval era and uh, they find a piece of parchment that has been written upon. And then because you know paper or parchment was uh, rare, then it would be erased and used again and erased and used again. And so that would mean that a researcher could actually read several different historical documents on the same document. Uh, on the same parchment. And so it seems like uh, urban streetscapes are also palimpsests, right? Because stuff gets built and it gets torn down and stuff gets built on top of it or stuff gets built, people move in, people move out, they rearrange stuff and a lot of stuff can potentially be forgotten uh, if uh, someone doesn't actually do that kind of, uh, I guess, figurative excavation work. So the reason why I decided to do uh, this project on this particular street named Georgia Avenue, and I, if any of you are familiar with Atlanta, Georgia Avenue is right in front of what was once Turner Field. Uh, so if you've ever seen the Braves play in Atlanta uh, before they moved to Cobb County, they used to play right in this neighborhood. And there are three reasons why I decided to do research on this particular neighborhood. Uh, the first was, uh, it was right around the time that the Braves announced that they were going to be leaving in town Atlanta, leaving this neighborhood, which is now known as Summer Hill, and moving to the suburbs. Uh, and so that was an interesting phenomenon. And so what's gonna happen to this neighborhood uh, that has been so reliant on uh, sports uh, spectacle commerce? And uh, then my own institution, Georgia State University, announced that they were interested in actually um, uh, claiming uh, what had once been Turner Field and turning it into GSU Stadium. And that has actually happened since then. And that has been part of a massive redevelopment of this neighborhood that uh, has really um, transformed it, what had been previously starting 
from really about the 1960s through very recently had been a neighborhood in significant decline and serious uh, you know, municipal disinvestment uh, and pretty impoverished. And now it's going through some real renewal um, and gentrification. And so that was interesting to me too. Uh, the third reason though, and I think the reason why I really kind of uh, set my sights on it is because this was all as I was beginning to do research on the 20th century history of immigrants in Atlanta. And as I started to track them, you know, where were their synagogues and their churches and their ethnic enclaves and their businesses and where did they live and where did they work? And it turned out that they all lived in this neighborhood, that it was the most robust immigrant and the most robust Jewish neighborhood in Atlanta from the 1890s through the 1940s or early 50s or so. So it was really all of these factors that made me just want to study it all the time. Georgia Avenue specifically had been sort of the central commercial district for the residential neighborhoods that had surrounded it. And so uh, a, I, I met somebody else who was doing interested, as a, someone in the neighborhood who was interested in doing this kind of research. And the two of us embarked upon this project. And I'll take, I, I'll show you just a couple of highlights. Uh, Kim, yeah, if you want to go two dots up, I think. To, uh, uh, no, I, no, that's right, that one. Okay, this is good. So what this does, um, is it is this is these are all of the uh, buildings that were on Georgia Avenue in 1940 and 1950. And if you hover the mouse over at the structures that are outlined in white, you'll uh, or maybe you have to click on them. It's been a while since I've yes. So you can see that I have actually been able to sort of locate the different stores around the neighborhood. Uh, and what you see when there's Lishkoff department store, what you can see from looking at this information is just how um, sort of how Jewish this neighborhood was and how important uh, Jewish commerce was, uh, Jewish entrepreneurs were to the commerce in this neighborhood. Uh, and if you go down one other uh, button, one next button, and here is the story of an, a, a picture of um, a, uh, the, the Rosenberg family who had a store on Georgia Avenue. And we had an opportunity to interview a couple of people who had grown up. So this is uh, um, Jack Rosenberg, who was a, she was like seven years old when this picture was taken. And uh, you know, the opportunity to really hear from the people who had uh, grown up in this neighborhood and to these men, the men that we interviewed were able to speak about how, um, what this neighborhood was like uh, and in ways that were, uh, I think even to many Jews who live in Atlanta, if they didn't actually grow up in the neighborhood, they, they might not even have known that this, uh, this culture existed in this part of the city. Um, and uh, finally, if you go down one more button uh, and scroll down a little bit too. One of the things that I, really uh, wanted to do with this project is to give uh, people who uh, are probably really familiar with what Georgia Avenue had looked like back when this project was made in 2018, 19 or so, uh, and let them see you know, what it looked like then and what it looks like now to really get them to start thinking about uh, urban change over time. I think it's really easy. One of the things that I, uh, found doing this project is that it's so easy to just look around, especially a city and think, well, that wasn't it always like this and not really think about uh, the possibility that other things had been there, different communities, populations had been there. And then it could lead to the question, you know, well, where'd they go? <laughs> what happened to them? What decisions were made that incentivized people either to leave or sort of compelled them to stay? Uh, so that's what uh, the, my goal was for this website, but it takes the neighborhood of Summerhill uh, from the early 20th century all the way through uh, the Braves leaving and Georgia State uh, coming in and, and uh, claiming the stadium and asking questions about, you know, 
not just questions about history, but also questions about equity. You know, what, what happens to a neighborhood that uh, you know, working class populations have relied upon for 50, 60 years that is quickly becoming uh, you know, a pretty uh, pricey neighborhood because of some of the, you know, people are interested in living in old neighborhoods now. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, fascinating. Um, Harlan, let's hear from you and then I have questions for the two of you. Okay, and so then I'll do the exact opposite. Um, I really have to um, sort of start at the end what we did produce because to be frank, when we started, we didn't know exactly where we were going. And to abuse a Jewish metaphor, we spent a lot of time wandering in the desert before we got to where we were going. Um, so if Kim, if you wanna pull up um, you know, the webpage for Mapping Jewish Charleston. So why don't we show you what we have here? So what we have here is we have four layers. So we have in 1788, if you scroll down a little bit, you'll see that we've got a little bit of information about what it was like maybe to live and you know, for Jews in Charleston there, and if you scroll down a little bit more, we won't link anymore, but you can see that there, we'll get there, that there's 15 different stories that we pursue um, that you could link on or not to. So we have one that's 1788, and if we go to the next one, going back up to the top, you can see we do the same thing with 1833, and with 1833, we don't have to go there, but you can take my word for it, we have 42 different stories about um, Jews in Charleston at the time. And if you go to 1910, which is the next layer again too, then we actually have um, 64 different stories. Um, again, the same thing, introduction, and then more links there too. And you see that we have different maps as we go along. And then finally, again, to abuse a Jewish metaphor again too, we didn't wanna leave it, you know, we wanted to um, put 2020 in there again too. We didn't wanna be like Lot's wife and have people think that just looking backward that Charleston Jewish history only existed at one time. Um, and I guess we're having trouble with 2020. It was a bad year. Um, um, there it is. And so then we just wanted to show everyone, you know, again, that Charleston is not a dead city. It's not that Jews did used to live there, but we also have 22 sites here. And these sites go a lot, um, a lot further and a lot deeper. So that's what we did achieve that mapping Jewish Charleston. Many of y'all are familiar with it. As to how we started out for it, um, it really started out long ago and far away um, with the Jewish Historical Collection, the work that Dale Rosengarten did, and then with Alyssa Neely, we actually started collecting, you know, materials for it. There was an exhibition that moved around the country, et cetera, et cetera. And then Dale and Alyssa have done a remarkable, astonishing number of oral histories. And so people actually started coming to us to use this history. But Charleston is a tourist city. So when they were coming, they did not want to just stay in the archives, you know, and they actually wanted to know what still existed. So we actually started long before we went virtual, we started actually putting together, um, and I'm old enough to like this, hard copy, non-virtual, real tours of the city. So, and we were timely at the anniversary of the 150th anniversary at the end of the Civil War, we did walking tours of, 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 of Jewish Charleston, Jews in the Civil War. We did walking tours of Jews and race. We did walking tours of Jewish merchants, depending on what the, people coming to town um, were interested in. So not just PowerPoints. So we already actually already started to amass a lot of, of, of map data, coincidentally. And then in 2015, this is arbitrarily while I start, six years ago, hard to believe. In 2015, Dale and I were at this meeting and we smelled something and it was money. We could actually smell money. You know, Dale has gotten a real good, you know, um, obviously way going out and finding it. But we were, um, we were having dinner with a man named Ira Jollis from the Kahneman Foundation. And they were an incredible foundation that had done wonderful jobs with um, Jewish mapping around the globe and stuff like that. And we were sitting at this dinner table and you know we almost wanted to give each other the high sign over the dinner table. Oh my goodness, someone has come to us. We are going to be able to make the best mapping Jewish history in Charleston. And about halfway through dinner, we realized that the foundation was in this odd part of its existence. It was going out of business. So it only had $25,000 to give us and there was never gonna be any more, but you know, we did not look a gift horse in the mouth and Dale and I said, okay, sold. 
So we thought, oh, $25,000 is gonna be great. We're gonna be able to do this for $25,000. And boy, were we wrong. Um, um, we did our wandering in the desert. We kept trying to figure out what we wanted to do. We didn't know anything. You know, We thought we Jews, Charleston history. We created a software platform, which we ultimately realized was a mistake. We should have gotten something out of the box. We're moving to something. But we kept trying to figure out what we wanted to do, endless meeting after endless meeting. And um, as we got a price tag to things, that's how we decided that we were gonna show Jews over time in the city of Charleston. You saw the four layers. So there basically was gonna be freeze frame. We we're gonna say what it was gonna be like to be a Jew in Charleston in 1788, 1833, 1910, 2020. And, but even from the very beginning, we had a lot of choreography, a lot of dancing around to do too, because as you saw quickly on that, we actually, you know, arbitrarily, why are we picking these dates? They have to be important to Jewish history. They have to be different from each other. But it was also very difficult trying to find a map that suited us. Charleston's a small city. So if we wanted to do something in the 18th century, we had to find an 18th century map that we could pin our things to, 19th century, et cetera, 20th century, 21st century as well too. So we, we know what we ended up with, but it really was an evolution for us, starting actually with the real world and then beginning to pin all our stuff. So I can't do math, but we now actually have like 145, almost 150 different stories, people, sites about what it was um, like to be Jewish in the city of Charleston in that time period. So we don't take one avenue like Georgia Avenue, we actually take the peninsula of Charleston and we don't do it continuously over a finite amount of time. Or, or, you know, We actually do it on a much broader scale, but we do it one slice at a time, similar to what Marnie does as well. And it's six years in the making and we live to tell the tale. Fantastic. And I also, I want to point out, I'd be remiss to not mention that we have another main contributor here to the Mapping Jewish Charleston project. We have Sherry Rabin, who was a principal investigator until she uh, went on to Oberlin. So um, I wanted to point out that Sherry's with us here. And hopefully, um, when we get to some questions about teaching resources, um, I can direct them your way as well. And if uh, I can add real quickly, it was the Pearlstein Lipoff Center that also, like I said, $25,000 was not enough. The Pearlstein Lipoff Center um, um, gave to make this vet, uh, uh, possible as well. And also the Charleston Jewish Federation. All in all, we think the budget was about $100,000, um, um, you know, with our time and stuff. But thank you all for making this possible. Um, okay, so we talked a little bit, um, I guess we'll, we'll keep going on the theme of resources. Could you tell me about the resources you use to make these projects come to life? Um, and could you give us a glimpse into your process of how you made these maps um, come into being? Uh, Marnie? I go first. Okay. Um, yeah, Kim, if you want to share again. So I'll say, first of all, that uh, I did do a platform that was out of the box. Uh, I used ArcGIS Story Map. And it is, I want to tell you all that it is free and you can start using it right now if you want. It's an amazing, uh, very easy to use and navigate sort of drag and drop kind of uh, free platform. And uh, it, it looks really, it makes it, it's very easy to make something look very slick. So uh, that was the uh, platform that I used. So we didn't, I didn't spend as much money. Uh, and uh, I used a lot of historical maps. If you look more closely at uh, the website, you'll see that I, I am using a lot of historical maps. And the nice thing about these, uh, the ArcGIS story maps platform is that you can layer um, uh, uh, geo-referenced historical maps on top of each other so that you really do get a sense of how the city changes over time and how the city is, uh, is uh, I guess, uh, interpreting, it's like municipal authorities who are making these maps are interpreting what's going on in particular neighborhoods and neighborhoods are going up in value or down in value and, um, and the kinds of, you know, uh, ambitious projects like highways and things like that that are being sort of imposed on neighborhoods. But one of my favorite, I, I'm gonna bring up, I'm gonna point out two of my favorite resources uh, that again are widely available and anyone can find this kind of stuff. The first is the Sanborn fire insurance maps. 
Uh, and uh, these were maps that were created going all the way back to the 19th century. They were made uh, for fire insurance purposes. So the, there's an incredible level of detail all the way down to um, how many stories are in a building, what the building's made of, uh, if, you know, what kind of ventilation is there. And, you know, that's not as interesting to me as like the social geography. So what these maps are of, uh, there are two of them. One is of, if you look at map, this first map 27, all the way to the left side, uh, King Street. And that's uh, one side of the of, of King Street. I think that I, I think that that is the east side of King Street. Um, and then the map uh, further down is the other side of King Street. And what this can show you uh, is once you, if you have a map like this, and then you are looking at what the neighborhood looks like now. I mean, a street like King Street, the structures are uh, not entirely the same, but a lot of the structures are the same. And so you can see, uh, you know, how the, the the stores were. Some they, probably one of the things that happens is that stores either get broken up into several storefronts, or several storefronts get. Uh, sort of glom together into one, or maybe, you know, a, a building has been cleared and turned into a parking lot. This excavates all of that. And for a neighborhood like the one that I'm doing research in, where uh, huge swaths of the neighborhood, you know, it used to be a grid with, uh, you know, thousands of homes and a hospital and synagogues and churches and stores are parking lots and highways and uh, a stadium. And so uh, this is how you really can see uh, a neighborhood that has just been turned into no place. Uh, how do we know what was there? These maps help us do that. But there's still the question of, well, what does this tell us about the people? And this is where the city directories come in. So Kim, if you could switch over to the King Street even city directories, if you wanna uh, make it a little bit bigger. So these are essentially uh, phone books, the white, although there aren't usually uh, phone numbers in there until you get to the 1940s or so, um, except in very wealthy homes. Uh, but these are uh, white pages and yellow pages. So you have everyone listed by, you know, their, the name of the person or the business alphabetically. You have uh, a listing of all of the businesses alphabetically, but what these city directories dating back to the 19th and into the early 20th century also have is street directories. And so you can take, this is King Street from 1930. And so you can see every single person who is on this street. Though there are some things this doesn't tell you, it doesn't tell you, you know, if the person who is located there uh, is a homeowner, that's something you can maybe get from the census, maybe, but uh, it does tell you things like, is it a business or a residence that will tell you that. It will also tell you the, especially in Southern cities, it will tell you the race of the person who is located there. And you know that from the little uh, C in parentheses. And this is what, uh, this is from the Charleston city directory. This is true of uh, city directories in all Southern cities that I have ever seen uh, from, you know, from this era. And so this, I mean, the social geography of uh, the, the historical research that you can do using these city directories is just phenomenal. And if you look at the street from 1930, you can see, first of all, that uh, you know, again, robustly Jewish commerce, uh, but not only, I mean, there also are, uh, I, I saw a couple of uh, Chinese laundries here. There are African-American uh, blocks that seem to be mixed in. And so this really does give you a sense of uh, what was, like, how did people live either together or sort of separated maybe just by, you know, a street corner, uh, but that, that separation, especially in the Jim Crow South meant everything. And what does this tell us about uh, how people interacted with one another? Uh, why did, the, 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 it brings up all kinds of questions about why, uh, you know, a particular block 
uh, is, is filled with uh, almost entirely Jewish stores or almost entirely African-American stores. Um, was this a decision that was made uh, by an individual or was it just sort of like a, you know, change that happened over time. But one of the things that I do with my class, when I teach a class on the history of Atlanta, is we grab the, um, the, uh, the Sanborn map and the city directory from 1927 or so from Auburn Avenue, which was uh, one of the uh, well, which was known as the wealthiest African American street in the country. It was a very um, sort of a, a, a middle class, a black middle class neighborhood in the city, uh, dating back to the early 20th century, and it has been sort of uh, urban renewed. Uh, to uh, to a really serious degree, and there's a highway that goes through it now. Uh, and so, to take my students through and give them a sense of, you know, you, you get the sense of like ghosts <laughs> that there was hit, there were people here, there was a neighborhood, there was a, there was such a rich life here, uh, and then the, so what happened to it? So that's I really love using these city directories and the Sanborn maps. For me, they really help to bring something that has that's hidden to the surface. Wow, what rich resources to play with, both in terms of research and the classroom. Thank you, uh, Harlan. Would you like to share a bit about your resources that you used? Sure. We obviously use the same things that Marnie did. Um, you know, Sanborn maps and city directories. You know, but because we weren't a specific street and because over time, as Marnie said, the Sanborn maps in Charleston, I think start 1882. That's, we're starting a hundred years earlier, 1788. Um, and city directories, there are no cross directories. There's one 1849, but you saw in that cross directory, it goes up and down the street listing everybody. Those don't start in Charleston again until the 1880s, cross directories. So once we got to those time periods, we could use them. So a long time before that, so maybe I'll talk, we really are oranges and apples. It's interesting how these projects go together. So we did use Sanborns, we did use, um, we did use city directories. One thing we also used was Google Earth. It was really interesting. I mean, many he, people know that, you know, that there was, um, I guess it was Beth Shalom's um, synagogue up on St. Philip Street. There was a building there on the same thing. There was Minion Alley off of, of King Street. And the Sanborn map would show where they were. And from standing on the outside of the street, we couldn't tell if that was the same building or not. It looked like a box, you know, maybe the building was set back or something like that. But at Google Earth, we could actually then look down. It was sort of a, 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 a sort of a kind of um, sandbarn map for today. So we actually began to hypothesize that a building that we thought had been totally destroyed, part of it still existed, which we could see on Google Earth. So those were some of the sources we used. Um, I really would like to talk a little bit about the human sources that we used. Um, you know, because we were doing something over time before these other sources existed, you know, we went to the standard sources, which would have been the Elsass history, you know, the Jewish histories of Charleston. We did not want to um, prove everything that had already been proven. So we specifically tried to um, find people that had not been found before. So we set ourselves up too. We specifically tried to do women. We specifically tried to do the non-movers and shakers. Um, and our sources for that were mining all the printed sources. I have to say a lot of it was pure blind luck. You know, since we were doing research and we were in archives for years, we would stumble across tiny little things that we knew nothing about, and we would always throw it in a folder. We would found that there supposedly there was a Jewish publication in Charleston in the 1880s, or there was another congregation, or there was another burial society, or there was a Jewish boarding house that we knew nothing about. So those were the little bits that we started to do. And I will say, as good as Sanborn maps are, and um, as good as directories are, we really did, because we wanted to do original research and find people that had been lost in sources that did not exist, we hired a historical researcher. Um, we were very fortunate um, to hire Sarah Fick. She, you know, she, she gets houses on the National, Rem National um, Register. She knew the deed office. And in Charleston, the deed office goes back into the 1690s. And so then she is the one that helped us find that. So if, you know, 
if if we're not maybe we tried to be who's Jewish in Charleston, we tried to do maybe um, what's Jewish in Charleston, when Jewish in Charleston. But one thing that we really did do by using Sarah and trying to decide exactly where things were is that this really is where Jewish Charleston was. But things that we were up against that perhaps did not exist in Atlanta is that Charleston burned so many times. So that like when Judah Benjamin's neighborhood where his mother had her shop completely gone, no way to trace where the buildings were. And the street numbering in Charleston, any, any, any um, deed researcher knows this, the street numbers in Charleston did not settle down until about the 1880s or 1870s or so. And so then what was 218 King Street in 1788 could be 57 today. And so odds and evens went. So we had a lot of really problems to figure out that to do that we had to have human intervention. Um, I'd like to at this moment just pause and say that if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, please put it in the chat box so we know that um, you'd like a chance to um, have a talk with our guests here today. Um, I'd like to hear a bit more now that we've talked about your process, I'd like to hear a bit more about what your takeaways were. Um, Harlan, I really liked how you put it that um, when you started out, you had barely a vague sense of what you were going to find or what you even wanted to find, but you ultimately ended up with a very vibrant, rich project. And Marnie, I'd imagine that in a way you had a similar experience. Uh, so with so much to discover, I'm curious to hear about what really truly surprised you in your findings. Harlan, would you like to go first? Sure, I mean, I can talk later maybe about some really interesting particular lies we found, um, you know, things that we had known about, you know, we found an intersex Jewish person in the city of Charleston, um, you know, before the Civil War. And I'll use that as a teaser to maybe talk about later, but only being half facetious, what we found out is something we kind of knew before we started that no one would ever start a project if we knew all the work um, that it was going to take to do it. Um, and I think one thing that we really found out about ourselves is how much we did not know. Um, you know, we thought we knew so much, but we spent so much time discovering things that we had never, which is, which is great, which is the issue of that too. And one thing I think we discovered as well, and this is a source that we had used, were digital newspapers, you know, searching, being able to word search in newspapers was incredibly helpful. One thing we discovered is how much people before us, before the digital age, how hard they had to work, you know, we're standing on their shoulders, historians like Saul Brebart that many of us know, he did not have digital newspaper indices to go through, he went through reams and reams of, of microfilm. So one thing that we discovered is one, we weren't as smart as we thought we were, we learned a whole lot. But then we also realized the incredible devotion and all the incredible time and effort of those who went before us. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of what my one of my advisors in grad school always used to say to me, you think you know what it was like for us grad students back in the day, but you have no idea. Um, Marnie, would you like to share? Yeah, I, I mean, I think I certainly learned uh, that I didn't know anything getting started and that I still, I mean, I finished the project and I still feel like I have so much to learn about uh, about how people uh, interacted with each other and lived amongst each other and how that uh, both determined and was determined by the built environment that they lived in. And as that built environment changed, how did that change them? So I, I'm still learning so much about that. I'm still uh, you know, I'm doing interviews with people who grew up in the neighborhood more recently uh, and watching it change again. And it just, it feels like it's a, it's a moving target <laughs> always. Um, I think that uh, another thing that uh, surprised me was, and I had hoped that this would be true, uh, but I wasn't sure, is uh, how central the, this neighborhood was to sort of the story that the city was telling about itself throughout the 20th century. Uh, because it was, I, it's the oldest residential neighborhood in the city. It dates all the way back to uh, just after uh, the Civil War. And which, by, you know, by Atlanta standards, that's old. So, you know, I, <laughs> I, I know that by Charleston standards, that's 
basically brand new. Uh, but uh, that the, you know, that this neighborhood became uh, an immigrant neighborhood and uh, how that sort of figured into the city's self image uh, as it tried to present itself as sort of the New York of the South, uh, a, you know, this uh, a cosmopolitan space in a, uh, in a provincial region and looking at immigrant populations and immigrant neighborhoods was one of the ways that they talked about that. And then as the neighborhood became, uh, came to be regarded as a neighborhood in decline, uh, the story of, well, we're going to take up urban renewal and public housing because Atlanta was the first city in the country to develop a public housing program and to build public housing projects. And one of them was in this neighborhood. And then, uh, uh, you know, the role that uh, highways and then sports facilities, huge, you know, massive sports facilities would play in late 20th century, like mid and late 20th century uh, ideas about how to uh, solve the problem of neighborhoods in decline. And the city kept making terrible decisions um, and sort of in hindsight, moving in the wrong direction about that. But the city kept looking at this neighborhood as a problem in need of a solution. Uh, and I think that that says so much about, uh, about you know, how the city saw its citizens and especially um, as the neighborhood became uh, more and more uh, African-American, uh, its citizens that were most in need of the city's help and weren't getting it. Uh, and so, you know, from the from the uh, the um, the modern perspective, you can see that that's probably where this was going. But to be able to, uh, through historical research, figure out what was the process by which that happened, because it all happens through de decisions that individuals and groups make. And so, what were those decisions? Uh, well, why did human beings make those choices, uh, and how did they play out? Uh, that's really been, I think, the big takeaway. And also just, uh, I, I have turned into an inveterate map nerd, historical <laughs> map nerd. I can't stop looking at maps and it's, uh, it's a delight. Um, so I, I think in a way, Marnie, you kind of talked, um, you spoke to my next question, but perhaps Harlan would like to um, weigh in on it. And if you'd like to elaborate a bit more, um, what do you think we learn from thinking about geography and not just geography, but geography on such a granular scale. I mean, it's interesting. I think what this geography project showed us and um, um, and I think, you know, we don't we lack the technical skills that Marnie does or has acquired. You know, I think we're, you know, if you know, we're more, you know, people nerds rather than uh, map nerds and stuff like that, trying to pin on maps. But one thing we, you know, we've always heard the old theory that Charleston was, Jews in Charleston were so accepted, you know, from the very early on, they could vote, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and actually we find that out through geography. It's really interesting, not just through laws or statutes or diaries or stuff like that too. Um, you look at the 1788 map, you look at the 1833 map, Jews are evenly distributed throughout the city. It's interesting, some of the descriptions, the synagogues at first are kind of a little hidden the way European synagogues are, but the people living around the city, they're all everywhere. Jews are living next door to blacks, whites, rich, poor. There is no Jewish ghetto until our 1910 map. And we can understand that. It's almost like, so all of this mass immigration coming to Charleston, South Carolina, it's almost they bring the old world with them and they create a ghetto, for lack of a better word, in the city of Charleston along St. Philip Street and along King Street. And we understand this and the, and the city directories verify this too because the Jewish families are sitting right there. They have to be, their Orthodox, their two synagogues are within two blocks of each other. The Jewish doctors in town, the Jewish day schools there, um, you know, the women's group, um, you know, the Israel, Daughters of Israel Hall, they're all within walking distance. There's little minions everywhere too. And so then we can see that they're reestablishing kind of a European Jewry in this Southern city where this kind of thing never existed before. And it's so interesting to think that in the, you know, from, you know, in, from the 1880s, 1890s until urban, until flight to the suburbs, this era, this era of this small place in the city of Charleston was an example of the melting pot of America. You, you know, you've got blacks, you've got Jews, you've got whites, you've got Irish, 
and you've got them all living in this very concentrated like four or five block area. So it, it proved some of the truisms and then it also created some really new interesting um, views of the city, not just of Jews, but of the city of Charleston itself. Yeah, uh, can I just say something about that too? Because I, I definitely, I mean, this whole neighborhood um, that uh, I, where I have not just Georgia Avenue, but the residential neighborhoods around it, I found the same thing that it, the, the Jews, um, at, by this point, by you know 1920 or so, most of the sort of Central European, the more or upwardly mobile Jews had left the neighborhood um, and East, it had become uh, primarily an Eastern European neighborhood. It was also a Greek neighborhood, an Assyrian neighborhood, an African American neighborhood. But with, it, but there was also um, a Sephardic Jewish uh, neighborhood within the Jewish neighborhood, and it was really, it was, it's been very interesting to see how, though everybody lived just one block away from each other, and African Americans lived, you know, ju you know just behind in the alleys, often uh, the alleys of the main streets that it was still so segregated, uh, not just by race in ways that you would expect in a, in a Jim Crow city, but also the degree to which Eastern European Jews and Sephardic Jews, you know, Sephardic Jews lived on Central Avenue and Prior Street and they, they went to Orva Shalom and you could the, talking to them about what their lives were like and the routes that they took to go to school that they sort of, they lived uh, next to each other, the, these different communities, even Jewish communities live next to each other, but uh, only came to interact with one another later on in the 1930s uh, and 40s, often um, it, it, as part of youth Zionist movements. So the degree of people living near each other and yet staying far apart from each other uh, has been a really interesting uh, phenomenon to try and track and understand. Uh, your comments about the Sephardi community living kind of side by side with um, the Ashkenazi community and other minority groups within the city make me think about, um, we're going to be hosting a number of events this semester highlighting uh, Sephardic Jewish history and kind of the erasure of Sephardi history in American Jewish history. And so that brings me to my next question about um, marginal histories or hidden histories. Um, I'm curious if you could share some of your discoveries. I know we've been talking a little bit about race and the segregated South, and I'm sure this must be front and center, and I'd love to hear about that, but also about gender history or LGBTQ histories and so forth that you've uncovered in these projects. Shall I go first? I'll be brief. Um, you know, race is always the most, you know, Charleston for a long time and a majority African American history, but it's the one that's always been sort of swept under the rug. So obviously we found out a lot of that there, um, you know, um, and it's not that it's hidden history, it's just people have not gone looking for it. Um, you know, I think we've gone looking for the relations between Jews and civil rights and stuff like that. And we've not necessarily gone looking for, you know, not to beat our breast for Jews and civil wrongs. Um, but we, you know, in the 1830s, we looked for Jews that owned slaves. We looked for the Jewish slave owners, you know, this, the slave marts that Jews ran and that kind of thing. And, you know, we also documented, you know, the Jewish men who had, you know, African-American concubines and, you know, and had, you know, people of color, children with Jewish last names. Um, so we certainly put those on the map as well. But on the same thing, too, we found things, too. We found daughters of an Orthodox rabbi that taught in a fully black school. You know, they taught only, you know, they taught as well, too. So we saw a lot of that um, going back and forth. You know, we pinpointed the home of activist Roy Cohen, who went on to Los Angeles to write Amos and Andy, um, kind of stereotypical things. So the history of um, Jews and Blacks, um, very, very um, interwoven there. And, um, you know, some of the stuff, um, and again, I guess you see some of the gender stuff with, again, crossing the color lines as well. Um, but, um, but then I'll let Marnie talk about what she discovered, and then maybe we can talk about some of the other stuff. We, you know, LGBTQ stuff is a project that the college is doing. It's funny, we've segregated our kind of little boxes of things. You know, we've done maps of LGBTQ life. We're doing maps of that. We're doing maps of Jewish life. 
And it's funny how they've not really, you know, there are points where they meet, but we've kind of self-segregated ourselves on that. Um, I, I think what I'll do is I'll, uh, I'll show a whole nother map. <laughs> um, and uh, Kim, if you'll show the, uh, the Atlanta sit-ins walking tour map. Uh, so this is uh, actually a map that I uh, advised a group, there it is, yes, a group, I advised a, a, a group of graduate students who were in my Atlanta history class as they were building it. And so what this is, is an online uh, walking tour of the sites that were, or uh, several of the sites, 12 of the sites uh, that were central to the uh, Atlanta student movement, which was one of the sit-in movements in 1960, 61, 62, uh, to, uh, uh, to try and uh, get Atlanta and other cities around the country uh, to uh, integrate public space and to uh, allow African-Americans access uh, to public accommodations uh, across the board. And, uh, uh, getting the student, so it's uh, maybe it's it's hard to uh, communicate uh, exactly how uh, much none of this stuff is uh, really talked about uh, in Atlanta's downtown. Uh, Atlanta's downtown, it really it feels like a historyless place. Uh, that there are some old buildings, uh, but there's very little. There's been very little done to try and uh, place make and to talk about, well, what is the history of this space and how has it changed over time and what happened here? Uh, so this walking tour that my students built, uh, again, with a fairly easy, I'm not sure what platform they use, but it was, I think, a fairly easy one to, to create. Uh, and they you know, did a, all this historical research and they, you can see if you look at the map itself that they built the tour around uh, how a person would actually do the walk so that it is, it is, uh, it, it makes sense if you start at number one and you could actually make your way all the way to number 13, uh, I think within about an hour or an hour and a half. Uh, and the, it, it's, there's so much in this, uh, in this tour that is either gone entirely or you would never know how important these sites were uh, to the local civil rights movement and really to the national civil rights movement because this was Martin Luther King city too. And as a matter of fact, um, one of the sites, I think one of the first uh, places where the tour takes you is to Rich's department store, which was owned by um, a, Jew a Jewish family, a very established Jewish family in Atlanta at this point um, in 1960. And uh, Martin Luther King was arrested at this neighbor, at this uh, department store, uh, as he was, he and a, a bunch of students were trying to uh, get the the restaurant, the Magnolia restaurant, uh, to uh, serve African Americans, uh, and that arrest was a huge national scandal. And there were some, there are some people who say that the uh, Kennedy, John F. Kennedy who was at that point not the president, but he was uh, running for president, his efforts to intervene on King's behalf and get him released from, uh, from jail uh, was what got the uh, African-American communities around the South to vote for him and what got him to actually uh, you know, become president. <laughs> and so this is a, you know, these are really important stories, not only locally, but also nationally. And to be able to interact with these stories by being in the built environment, I think is a really wonderful thing. I'm struck by looking at this map and the stories you're telling and the implications of sharing these stories. Um, there was a comment earlier about using these maps and these projects as teaching tools. And so I'm very curious to hear, I know you had student involvement in each of your projects, but I'm also curious to hear about um, pedagogical discoveries um, you've made through these projects. And I know we have Sherry here in the audience as well. So if she'd like to weigh in, that'd be great too. Yeah, I would love to hear from Sherry too. I'll just say that uh, this that for students, who I, I think this is, you know, especially true uh, maybe of younger people uh, who really do come to an environment and it doesn't quite occur to them how uh, much it might have changed over time. Like when you've lived in a city for a couple of decades, you remember, oh, didn't it used to be that? 
And when you're 20, you don't necessarily know. Um, and so to lay these maps on them and to have them actually walk around and get a sense of historical imagination where they can get, you know, really think about like, who are these people who lived in the space and worked in these spaces and spaces and created stores and, uh, and places of worship. Uh, it, I have seen it rewire so many students' synapses. Uh, it gets them really to think in a very co you know, concrete way uh, about historical change uh, and about themselves as part of this historical continuum because once you start recognizing how much things have changed since the past, you start to realize it's not always gonna be like this either. And uh, it, I, I, I have found it to be an amazing teaching tool for getting students to think historically, not just and about I, the subject itself, but about you know, history as a, as a way of thinking about the world. And if I can just say briefly, we've used students on another thing, discovering.cfc.edu, basically a college website, discovering Charleston history, and we're discovering African-American history. It's really interesting. It's almost the reverse of how we did it. It's the it's using digital initiatives that convince students of the reality of things because they can actually walk the streets and see where this happened. They do the digital research. They see the images of the building beforehand. They do that too. But it makes it more real for them because there is a parallel real world where they can see it and so then it's a nice men it's a nice meshing of of real and virtual and you know and not just doing online learning and stuff like that so i've i've discovered that in students they get so excited that there is a real world application there's something physical that they can touch that people before them touch too very meaningful exercises with students here um I just looked at the time and realized we are basically out of time. Um, so I'm very torn on the last question. I'm going to push my luck because um, given uh, the age we're living in currently and um, we are all spending a lot of time thinking about social justice issues and um, how to be better allies, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the so social justice implications of your projects and if you have broader visions for them, if you've seen responses, um, people respond to them in light of um, contemporary politics and whatnot, what are the potential broader implications for these projects? Well, I, I had really wanted the Georgia Avenue project to be part of a conversation in the city uh, about gentrification uh, and about, you know, what, how, how should the city uh, respond to uh, the needs of, uh, you know, a neighborhood uh, that where longtime legacy residents are finding themselves getting you know, priced out of rent uh, because uh, so many new huge houses are being built and new people are coming into the neighborhood and neighborhoods change, uh, cities change. Uh, there's no avoiding that, of course, uh, but, uh, but it does seem, I wanted the, the, the website to uh, help and maybe inspire some people to think about how the policy responses <laughs> uh, that could uh, you know, help to, to, to enhance some equity. Uh, the forces of development uh, in Atlanta, I think in most cities are really powerful. Uh, and so I hope that my, I know that my website has gotten a lot of traction and every once in a while it gets, you know, reposted and sort of makes the rounds again. And I've been on local radio a bunch of times uh, and I'm still doing this research and I'm hoping that I'll be able to continue to uh, talk about this. Uh, I, but I, you know, I don't know how much of an effect it's actually going to have, but uh, I hope that it has inspired some people to think. And I, and I especially hope that it has inspired Atlanta's Jewish community to think about what happened to a space that used to be so, it used to be the Jewish neighborhood in the city, and then it wasn't. And uh, Atlanta's Jews have had an opportunity to, you know, partake of, uh, you know, uh, real estate and uh, excellent schools in a way that 
African Americans, poor African Americans in the city haven't. And so, you know, if, if uh, learning about this history inspires maybe some action, uh, I would love that, but we'll see. Ali can be very brief and, and be very concrete. I, I said, I talked about how we're ghettoizing things and um, you know there is a new website being built in the city of Charleston called the Charleston Justice Journey, which is specifically a site of, again, as, as you would well imagine as it's named. And I find it very interesting that they are now linking to our site because that's one ex ex exact thing that we can see, you know, as they are talking about civil rights, we coincidentally just covered some of those same things too. So they're actually linking to us and actually using research that we did actually just kind of tilting it to a slightly different audience. Um, but oftentimes they're actually using our images and using our thing is too. So it's kind of a very small way to do it too. But I can see, as Marnie said, we can see if we're not making policy changes, we can see that people interested in social justice and specifically doing digital projects on that are now, you know, with they're not cribbing from us with our very, you know, wholehearted, you know, gratitude. They are using the work that we did and just pitching it to a slightly different audience and doing it in a slightly different way. And I think that's all for the good. Absolutely. Well, we are out of time. So I want to thank you both. Um, I think you've all turned a fair number of us, if not all of us into map nerds tonight. And, you know, I think we won't look at maps the same after this, but on a serious note, I'm struck by how rich your projects are, um, how rich these maps are, and also by the implications of the work you're doing. So thank you very much. Um, and for those of you who would like to tune in for future events that we have here at the Perlstein Lipoff Center for Southern Jewish Culture, the Jewish Studies Program, and the Jewish Historical Society of South Carolina, all of our events are on our website. So we hope to see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>